This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings, or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. All right, well, let's get started this morning. Oh, I'll shut the door. We'll have a word of prayer, and we'll jump in here. Lord, we thank you for your word, and as we discuss uh, what we've been reading in your word this week, we ask that you open our hearts and minds to truth, and would you encourage us from it? In your son's name, amen. This is the first time I typed it out on the screen, because there's a lot of different passages this week. So by the time we started in about Ezekiel 43, and this morning, you should have read Obadiah and Jonah. So, anybody pick up anything in their Bible readings that you found interesting or of note? Or Everybody's... What? Okay, so you want me to look up a word? Jose, um, that's not right. Hosea doesn't have 41 chapters. Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Um, and the galleries round about on their three stories. It's like a fence around your roof so people don't fall off. Okay, so I, yeah, that's good. Um, over uh, street, architectural term, passage street overhang. Um, but notice here they say uncertain. It's only used four times in scripture. Huh, all of which are in Ezekiel 41 and 42. Yeah. No, it's not like an art gallery. Um yeah. So there we've de defined a term for you, at least loosely. Really? Yeah. Maybe, like an overhang. Yeah. So, an overhang. So this lexicon has a recessed balcony area along an upper floor of a building. So, there you go. Anybody else have anything they noted? Or any questions about? Okay. If not, I've got something today. And then I'm going to have... Uh, We've got some missionaries with us, so I don't want to take all the time. I want to leave some time for him this morning. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the book of Jonah, if nobody has any other questions. So this is something... Oh, okay, my wife has a question. Yes? Okay. Sheol. Yeah. No, I'm not going to elaborate on that. So the, could you rephrase the question shortly? I'll write it down, and that is a question I can come back to. So Okay. 
Yeah, that that deserves some good discussion for later. That gives me homework to do. So, okay. We'll hit a little bit of that, actually, with some things I want to bring up. But before I speak to that, I want to brush up and do my homework on that. <laughs> so, um, so, any other questions? Not that I'm trying to put you off, but that's... So this is something I didn't get to when I preached to Jonah about it. Uh, let me make sure this is... But I thought I want to bring it up now because it's it's a very interesting. Uh, how do I say this? It, it's just very interesting to think about with the book of Jonah. So I have here Jonah and the dragon. Does that sound a little odd? I hope it sounds odd. Okay. Now, when I preached through Jonah, I I used the kind of illustration or. It's a story we're familiar with. You know, we have Jonah and the fish. And so this is kids' books and how they depict it. So what's the story of Jonah all about? Jonah the big whale or fish, right? Well, that's only actually a couple verses of the whole thing. And um, most children's stories completely skip chapter 2 and they completely skip chapter 4. Okay? And then they usually make up lots of stories in the middle of like how Jonah was this really righteous, good person, and da 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 And it's like, no. Um, but what I want you to look at today is something I really couldn't get into preaching, but some of the ancient Christian art that depicted Jonah. Okay? So here is Jonah and the... Let's see here. There's Jonah in the... Does that look like a fish or a whale to you? You would have to use that term. That's actually very key. <laughs> Serpentine, okay? Uh, this, was, this is about a 9th century um, Byzantine picture. So it's not necessarily right around the time of Christ or anything. It's, it's after that. But how about that one? <laughs> Definitely doesn't look like a fish or whale, does it? <laughs> Okay. Well, kind of, yeah. How about this one here? I mean, that kind of looks a little bit like... It, it almost looks like a seahorse, doesn't it? Um, right, okay. Um, here's a little bit later one, a bit maybe closer to medieval period. You know, it... So now here's, here's one that might deserve some more attention. Th these are kind of neat because there are different reliefs where... Let's see if I can draw on it. I'm not sure if I can. So it actually tells the story of Jonah in a picture, which early Christian art, this is part of what it was doing, is because not everybody was literate. So they would, they would make these art pictures that the story could be retold with and you know people could... But you start the story um, somewhat in this area here with with Jonah ending up on the boat. After he's on the boat, he ends up in the dragon. And then ultimately the story ends with him under like this fig tree. Okay, So you see how you kind of have elements of... And I'm not going to sit here and dice the art and all the different imagery in it. Uh, but does this dragon thing, does that look like a fish? No, it has definitely... Ooh, you're hitting on something. You're hitting on something. Um, and here's another exact invert of the order. You, you have Jonah going from the boat, and then you have this creature thing, and this creature thing vomits Jonah out, and then you have the end of the story of Jonah with Jonah under a vine. Okay? So, there's... Early Christian art definitely didn't depict it the same way we're depicting it for our children's books. Um, if I can get PowerPoint to behave. I have trained you guys well. <laughs> you guys are asking good questions. I'm going to get through a few more pictures, and then we're going to talk a little bit about it. Here's another one. Uh, this is part of a, uh, an old manuscript, actually, 
um, of the story of Jonah, which I don't know all the details. This, okay, you can't see that. This spot right here, that's a Greek word, so I'm wondering if it's a, a, like a Septuagint manuscript or something. I don't, I, I don't know for sure. I am not an expert on Christian art, okay, so I'm not going to pretend to be that. Here's another one. Yeah, almost looks like a crocodile mouth, okay. Um, and here's, uh, this one's a little harder to tell because of the erosion of the image, but here's the sea monster right here. It almost looks like a dog mixed with a dragon mixed with some sort of sea creature, okay? Now, we have no idea. <laughs> So the question becomes, why would they have all this imagery, not just one, but that more depicts a dragon or serpent than that would be close to a whale or a fish? Maybe. Um, God definitely did prepare it, okay? Um, now, a couple, a couple more modern people debate what fish it was. In fact, there's now a fish in the Mediterranean that has the name Jewfish, and it's been known to swallow divers whole and then spit them back up, you know, um, which a diver with oxygen tanks and whatever can live inside of a fish for <laughs> a while. But it's, it's about the, this fish generally grows about the size of your dining room table. It's, it's a big fish. Um, Uh-huh. Right, yeah. Um, now, we're not trying to take away from the miracle here, okay? It was a miracle that Jonah survived in the belly of a fish, animal, whale, whatever it was. That's a miracle. God did it. He didn't have oxygen tanks, okay? So some of the material I'm going to present is actually this is from this article on... Jonah and Leviathan, <clears throat> and some connections here. It's a journal article. Um, but what I want to start with is an, a portion from the uh, Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament. It says, the LXX, which means Septuagint. So Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew text. Um, the da, daha or daga, I'm not sure it's, it's a term for fish. It's predominantly translated fish. But in Jonah... They don't translate it as fish. They translate it as the same word for Leviathan or sea creature. Okay, and so uh, in Jonah 1.17, it says, The Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and it, they translate that as sea creature. Um, some interesting things in the text of Jonah, and I, this isn't well polished or put together. I'm just, I kind of threw this together this morning because I, I think it's interesting. The Christian art was very much driven by theology, okay? And that's, sometimes it, we miss a few things. Um, this tempest in the sea, the tempest really should have been, it's picturing here a little bit of, it's like a dragon stirring in the waters making trouble, okay? This is hearkening to his ancient, um, they viewed like uh, Tiamat and, and, and Yom as these creatures in the, the, the sea was chaotic and turmoil and, and uncontrollable and wild in the ancient perspective. And here you have this sea creature who, who put the sea creature there? God did. And it's turbulently in the waters, as it were. Um, another neat thing from the passage. So the shipmaster came to him and said, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise and call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we, be not, that we perish not. So it's interesting, the shipmaster is actually the term for like master of the ropes. Okay? Um, and so he is the, the master of the ropes. It hearkens to a passage from Job dealing with Leviathan. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? 
So here's this master, the shipmaster, chief of ropes, who can't control, can't draw in, can't weather through the storm of this sea creature. Um, and so the, the chaos of the sea is, is pitted against his ability to save. Um, and this actually becomes a point in Christian thinking and discussion where they start to put Christ as... Um, they, they describe it in some funny terms. It's like Christ is, on, is the worm on the hook that draws the, the, the devil into his own destruction. Um, now, I'm not going to elaborate on that too much because Christ did lay himself down and sacrifice, but there's some themes here coming in. Another interesting one is this in Jonah 1.13. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land. Pretty simple in English, right? They, they're rowing to get to land. This is where it gets really weird, and this is the beauty of Scripture. The authors of Scripture are interconnecting so many passages, and this is tying into actually a theme with sea creature in Leviathan. The term for road there, in all other uses except one in the Hebrew Bible, is a term for digging through walls. It's not the term for rowing a boat. That's weird. The one exception to that is in Amos 9. And in Amos 9 we read, They digged into hell, thence shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. So it's, it's those who are, have rebelled against God, they're trying to get away, they're trying to flee from God, and they're, they're getting anywhere they can to get away from God. In verse 3, it says, And though they hide themselves on the top of Carmel, I will search and take out from thence. And though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, thence will I command the serpent, and he shall bite them. And the term for serpent there is the term for Leviathan. I'll read a, a portion from an article here. Um, <clears throat> of particular interest in the Jonah passage is the term for row. It, it's an uncommon word appearing only eight times in the Bible. With one exception, it always refers to digging through walls, as I mentioned. The exception is Amos 9.2, where it refers to Sheol, Okay, that's the place of the dead, and that we'll get to some of that next week, hopefully. Thus, it's used in Jonah for rowing in water is unique. Moreover, since Jonah refers to the sea that covers him as the womb of Sheol covers a person, or they're engulfed in Sheol, the sailor's rowing invites us to recall its usage in Amos. In a prophecy, it's also shaped by Tanin traditions, that's sea creature or sea monster traditions. Thus, Amos' Amos's prophecy begins by Yahweh threatening to cut open the enemy and strike him upon his head with a sword while allowing none to flee. Amos describes the enemy's frantic escape to dig into Sheol as an impossible attempt to escape the Lord. Although they be hid from my sight on the floor of the sea, then will I command the serpent and he will bite them. The, the verse 3 there. <clears throat> that Leviathan is intended here is shown not just by the context, but by the Septuagint's rendering of a certain word here. Um, the passage also shares in common Jonah a context of fleeing from before the Lord. Isn't that interesting here? In Amos, these people who have rebelled against the Lord, they're trying to get away from him. And who, who is Jonah trying to get away from? What's that? The Lord. Okay. The interesting thing is, in one sense, Leviathan is, is a creature God created, God send, sent, and God told Leviathan to swallow Jonah. Okay? Jonah is actually being pictured as a very dangerous prophet, because when God gave a word to Jonah, what did Jonah do? He runs. This creature, this chaotic creature of sea, whatever, Leviathan, serpentine, whatever, that God created... And as Job says, you know, he, he, it's in his creation. It obeys God better than God's prophet. Kind of a scary... And, and then by the end of the story, Jonah's not fully repentant because he's upset with God because God showed mercy to the Ninevites. Uh, another couple things to note here. Um, in verse two, chapter 2, verse 5, The waters compass me about, even the soul, the depth closed me in round about, the weeds were wrapped around my head. Okay? So the Hebrew in Jonah never says this term Leviathan.
but some of the language and elements of Leviathan or Tiamat traditions are interwoven in the story of Jonah. And so here you have almost a serpentine imagery. Yes, it's the weeds wrapping him about, and it's the weeds, you know, but it's, it's the same type of an idea of, of a, of a ser serpent wrapping around somebody and, and constricting them or encapsulating them. Um, yeah, I've got to keep moving. There's more details here. But uh, Jonah 1.17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Okay? Serpents are known for swallowing their prey whole. So it's tying into this. We're not saying, okay, it wasn't a fish or a whale, you know. The authors of Scripture are brilliantly using language to tie the reader's mind to some of these other passages, these other connection points. Um, this one here probably ties closely to Psalm uh, 89, where we read, That was broken Rahab, which is another, this is not Rahab the harlot. Um, this is another uh, serpentine, this word's actually a bit complicated. It's probably a, a, a spinoff of the word raw. Uh, which Pharaoh referred to himself as Ra, and it was like a derogatory term towards Egypt, but it's also tied to this imagery of these serpents and dragons in the sea type thing. Um, and it's referring to God here. He's broken Rahab in pieces as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. The heavens are thine, referring to God's heavens. The earth is also thine. As for the world and the fullness thereof, thou hast founded them. So one of the ancient Mesopotamian slash Canaanite traditions was that of these gods, one of them lost this battle with the other one, and they split its body in half, and that's what made the half made the heavens and half made the earth. This is bizarre. This is weird. Okay, but this language in the Bible, it's saying no, no, no. God's the one who won the victory here. God's the one who made the heavens and the earth, and it's using that language to describe what God did in. Other ancient Near Eastern material, when they talk about creation, there's war, there's conflict, there's chaos. It's, these dragon creatures are their forces to be contend with. In the Genesis account of God's creation, it starts off with the, the chaotic waters in the deep in Genesis 1 and 2, but it has the tanin, which is another term for dragon, leviathan, sea monster. It has that as a creature within God's creation that, oh yeah, this is good, like, he plays in God's water. God made this. And God's in control of this. Um, so Job picks up on some of this language. He said, He divideth the sea with his power, referring to Leviathan. And by his understanding, he smiteth through the proud. By his spirit, he hath garnished the heavens. He hath formed the crooked serpent. Okay? So here's a, the same term for Rahab here translated as, as Leviathan. Um, so I'm going to quote a passage here, and then I want to give some time to our missionary. In Christianity, Jonah was a favorite figure for allegory, taking their lead from Jesus' statement that Jonah was a sign. Now, I want to stop here. When Jesus refers to Jonah in Matthew 12, he's the sign of three days, you know, he talks about, the, I'll be in the tomb for three days. He uses the Greek term for sea monster, not the ichthus for fish. So he follows the tradition that laid forward of the Septuagint, where the Septuagint was translating from the Hebrew, and they gave it that more broad meaning, as it were. Um, early theologians depicted him as prefiguring Christ, descending into the fish like Jesus into hell, and delivered it from, for the salvation of the Gentiles. Early Greek patristic works identified Jesus as the worm on the fish hook of Job 40, verse 25, who lures the devil to his demise. The devil is none other than Leviathan, whom Revelation 12 and 20 recognize as Satan. In Western Christianity, beginning with the 3rd century, uh, one, painting, uh, one finds paintings, sarcophagi, and other funerary art like, that link Jonah to Leviathan by, by depicting the fish as a fantastic sea monster with large, sharp teeth, tall ears, mammalian forearms, and long serpentine tail. Okay? And I showed you some of those pictures and images. So what's the point of even talking about this? Okay, one, I want you to see how the beautiful Hebrew is. Like, I don't know Hebrew the language, but it interconnects with biblical themes. The Leviathan theme is tied closely to a theme of chaos 
and destruction and actually like Sheol in the place of the dead. Okay? And we have a God who brings order out of chaos. And you take the story of Jonah and you see this. What happens when you run from God? Life descends into chaos. So let's think about Pharaoh in Egypt. Pharaoh is resisting God. What happens to Egypt? It's decimated. Chaos is unleashed. As I was reading through some of this material this morning, it's even interesting. Leviathan, the sea serpent imagery, all that um, gets tied in. What did, what got parted when Israel left Egypt? The Red Sea. The sea and the chaotic water imagery and the parting of that ties right into the Leviathan being cut to piece or departed by God. Um, it's picking on some of the, the, the ancient Mideastern thinking. Um, God's the one who parts the waters. He brings order out of chaos. He brings his people through chaos to dry ground. Um, and so I've, I've preached on that theme before, and I don't need to rehash it here. But any comments or questions? I got to... So they cast lots, or drew straws, basically, and uh, determined... Which, the funny thing was, the sailors knew Jonah was running from God because he had already told them he was running from his God. I guess I yeah, yeah. And, and the, the sad thing is, it, Jonah's running away from his God, but his God is the God who rules the whole earth. But I don't think the sailors knew that because they all had their other gods, too. So, to draw was the only, like, option they had. Because... Yeah, you know, no. These are pagan sailors. They're depicted as pagans. But this is part of the beauty of the book of Jonah. Who acts more righteous in this book? Who, the sailors, they offer sacrifices, which you don't offer a big sacrifice and get a fire going on a wooden boat. So it seems like they possibly got to land and made sacrifices. We don't know, it's an assumption, but the whole book of Jonah is written as like a piece of satire. Everything's upside down. The prophet of God who should speak for God and who should live for God and should be an example of what it's like does everything wrong. The sailors who you anticipate to be pagan and fully worldly, and when something like this happens, what do they do? They turn to God. And they respond. And they listen and they obey. And so there's this sad irony. Um, mm hmm. Yeah. And. I might kill too much of your time. Is this the first story in Scripture of God's man not acting as good as those who, how do I say, the Gentiles? Do we have any other stories like that? Abraham lying about his wife. And I didn't think that the, God, you know, the fear of God was in this place. So, you know... Yeah, so, and <laughs> he was presenting the truth a certain way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so anyway. <laughs> right. So anyway, any other comments or questions? I, it is a good, Jonah's a great book. It's a lot of fun. I think our children's stories kind of whitewash it a bit <laughs> and sugarcoat it, yes. So uh, with that, um, Nathan, why don't you come and present what you're doing?